Welcome back to Now Let's Be Honest. I'm David Tate, and this is part 27 in our series going through the Gospel of Matthew. And I hope that y'all are buckled up and ready, because today we are going to cover a big chunk of scripture going all the way from Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, through chapter 9, verse 17. And since we have so much to cover, I'm just going to hop right in and recap the context for us so we can kind of remember where we're at in the Gospel of Matthew. And so starting last week, we entered into this new section of the Gospel of Matthew, which I am calling the Miracles of the King. Uh, Coming fresh off the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus basically made a bunch of really big claims about himself that really need to be backed up, right? Um, Really the big takeaway from the Sermon on the Mount that we see the people taking away is that Jesus is a guy who claims to have a whole lot of authority. Like going right off the Sermon on the Mount, when people are marveling at the end of it, it says that they are marveling at his authority because nobody teaches like he does. And so going into Matthew chapters 8 and 9, the big question is, does Jesus have actions that will back up the words that he has said, right? Because he's made a lot of big claims in Matthew chapters 5 through 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, but do his actions back that up? And really what Matthew's trying to argue here is that yes, they do. And what we see is we see a series of three different miracles, um, well, three different cycles of three different miracles, right? And so last week we covered that first cycle and I called those miracles of healing, right? So we covered three different miracles, which were immediately followed by a description of Jesus' ministry and then a subsequent call to discipleship, right? And that really is the structure of Matthew chapters 8 and 9, right? There's going to be three different cycles that each follow that structure. Miracle story number one, miracle story number two, miracle story number three, description of ministry and call to discipleship. We saw the miracles of healing last week, and then going into this week, what we're going to see are what I am actually calling miracles of authority. And since this is the center cycle, I really think this is the one that Matthew is trying to draw emphasis to, right? It's bookended by the miracles of healing on one side and the miracles of restoration on the other side. But right here, the miracles of authority, this is what Matthew is really trying to get at in this whole section. And so this is like a really major portion of just Matthew's whole gospel, right? The section we're going to cover today is where you get to see some of the coolest miracles that Jesus performs, but the interesting thing about them is that they're not simply cool. What is being communicated here is that Jesus is so much more than what the people originally expected the Messiah to be. And what we're going to see in the three miracles that we're going to see today is that Jesus is a prophet, he is a king, and he is a priest right? Uh, And just going off of this, like basically the miracles we're going to see today, just to kind of just give you the spoiler right now, is the first miracle we're going to see is Jesus calming a storm, right? The second miracle we're going to see is Jesus casting demons into a herd of pigs. And the third miracle we're going to see is Jesus healing a paralytic, right? And if you just walk through each of those one by one, you'll see how this references Jesus as a prophet, a king, and a priest, right? Because like Jonah sleeping in the midst of the storm and having to be cast into the water in order to calm the storm, Jesus, he calms a storm with the words from his mouth, right? He is the greater Jonah. He is a prophet, right? And then you go to Jesus casting the demons into pigs. Well, if you go back to the story of King David, if you remember his whole story began whenever he was playing music in the throne room of King Saul, right? And so David, as a future king, he was this person who could soothe the demons and cast demons out by the playing of his music. Well, Jesus, the greater king, the greater David, he's able to cast out demons once again by the words of his mouth. And then when you go into that third miracle, the miracle about the healing of the paralytic, what we're going to see is that that miracle isn't as much about healing the paralytic as it is about forgiving the paralytic's sins, which is again, something that Jesus does by the words of his mouth, right? Jesus is the greater priest. He doesn't need to offer a sacrifice to forgive sins because as we're going to see by the end of this gospel, Jesus himself is the greater sacrifice. And so just these three miracles, what Matthew is trying to accomplish here is he's trying to argue that Jesus fulfills all three offices that we would consider anointed offices, right? He is the greater prophet. He is the greater king. He is the greater peace, uh, the greater priest, right? He calms storms with the words of his mouth. He casts out demons with the words of his mouth, and he forgives sins with the words of his mouth. Other priests, other prophets, other kings, they need to do more things in order to accomplish this stuff. Jonah had to be cast into the water. David had to play music, right? Priests had to offer sacrifices. Jesus, he speaks and he accomplishes the prophetic, the kingly, and the priestly role. As a result of this, what we're going to see through Jesus' words is that Jesus is actually demonstrating his divine power in these miracles more than he has anywhere else, right? We've seen slight allusions to Jesus being God, 
in previous passages in the Gospel of Matthew, but it's really this cycle that we're going to look at today where we really see Jesus' divine power being made manifest. And all of a sudden, people are going to be very, very shocked by what Jesus is doing, right? That's why I call this the miracles of authority, right? Because what Jesus is going to do, one by one, is he's going to demonstrate that he has power over nature, right? He's going to calm a storm. He's going to demonstrate that he has power over the supernatural whenever he casts out demons. And he's also going to demonstrate that he has power over sin, right? Whenever he heals the paralytic. And so those three things are things that only God himself has power over, yet Jesus is going to demonstrate that he has that power. And as a result, we're going to see this progression of the story that we didn't see in last week's cycle, right? Because last week we saw the miracles that Jesus performed, but we didn't really see how people responded to Jesus, right? We saw a little bit of it whenever Peter's mother-in-law immediately got up and began to serve him, but we really didn't get to see many reactions. Well, that's going to all change in this cycle right here, because as Jesus performs these miracles, we're going to see that Matthew is using these miracles to set up responses to how people are going to see Jesus. As Jesus reveals more of who he is, he begins to draw a line in the sand, and people are going to have to decide where they land. Some people are going to respond favorably. Other people are going to respond unfavorably. Other people are going to try to land in the middle, and as the gospel progresses, Jesus is going to make it clear there is no middle ground. If you are not with me, you are against me. And so that's really what we're going to be seeing happen in these verses here, right? Jesus is declaring who he is, and through that, he's really beginning to show people that he is more than just a man. He's a greater prophet. He's a greater priest. He's a greater king than anybody who came before him. And the reason why he's better than all those things is because he is ultimately the one unto whom all those offices pointed, right? A prophet speaks the words of God. A king rules the people of God. A priest serves the ministry for God. Jesus is God, right? And that's really what we're going to see um, really unfolding over the course of this whole passage. And then after we cover those three miracles, we're going to once again see a description of the, Jesus' ministry, followed by a call to discipleship. And it's going to get really cool in this passage because we're actually going to see Matthew himself, the author of the gospel, describe his own calling and how he came to first follow Jesus. That being said, there's our little preview. Let's actually hop in and look at this passage. Starting in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27, this is what we read. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with waves. But Jesus himself was sleeping. And they came to him and got him up, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you so cowardly, you men of little faith? When he got up and rebuked, uh, then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. And the men marveled and said, what kind of a man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? All right, I'm going to have this really, temp like, I'm going to have a really strong temptation to talk way too long about this story. <laughs> and so I'll try to hold myself back a little bit. But this story right here is one of my favorite stories in all the Gospels. And it's also one of the most misused stories and one of the most misunderstood stories in all the Gospels, right? Uh, because most often what you'll see whenever you encounter this story in the general public and whenever people talk about this story is they will make this life application thing about how Jesus, just like he calmed the storms on the Sea of Galilee, he can also calm the storms in your life. And you know what? That is a true statement. Yes, Jesus can calm the storms in your life. And as a result, we have wrote, written thousands of worship songs about it. But that's not what this story is about. You want to know how I know that God can calm the storms in my life? Well, because if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Right? God created everything, and so he can handle anything. Right? So yes, of course, God can handle the storms in your life. That's absolutely true. Praise be to God. But that's not what this passage is about. And that's why I'm really wanting us to just kind of get rid of that thought process and actually just understand the story in and of itself. Because I think what the story is teaching is something so much more beautiful. And this is really the story where the disciples begin to realize for the first time that Jesus might be something more than just a man, right? He's been making these really big claims to authority, and people are trying to figure out what to do with all these claims. But right here is when the disciples begin to realize, ooh, who is this guy that we're hanging out with? And it seems like they begin to lean towards the idea that maybe Jesus is in fact divine. And so let's actually start walking through it. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, 
right? So this is immediately picking up after the story we just read um, in the previous verses, right? So Jesus heals Peter and mo- Peter's mother-in-law, and then after that, he heals a bunch of other people, and then they begin making their way towards the boat, and he encounters various different people who are asking about following him and stuff like that. Now Jesus gets into the boat, and we read that his disciples followed him. Interestingly, uh, this word disciples, right? Um, a big part of the Gospel of Matthew is discipleship, right? That's a huge aspect of it. Um, but this is only the third time that we actually encounter the word disciples in the entire text so far, right? The first time was in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, where we got to see all the disciples gathering around Jesus to learn from him, right? And then the second time was actually just a few verses earlier in chapter 8, verse 21, where we see one disciple coming up to Jesus and asking to follow him, but ultimately turning away, right? Right here, we see the word disciple again, and the main reason I'm highlighting this is because what Matthew is doing with this word is he's demonstrating to us what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, right? So formerly, we saw that a disciple of Jesus is apparently somebody who sits at his feet and learns from him. That's what we saw in Matthew chapter 5. In verse 21, we saw that apparently a disciple of Jesus is somebody who has to prioritize him above everything else, and if they're not willing to do that, they shouldn't follow him. All right, so there's a cost to discipleship. But then notice what Matthew argues for here, right? Here we have disciples showing up and they're following Jesus like they should, but they follow him into danger. And I think ultimately that's what Matthew is trying to argue for here uh, whenever it just comes to what he's saying about discipleship, right? Um, The way that discipleship really just plays out for us as Christians is that we follow Jesus and he doesn't lead us into safety like we always hope, right? Instead, Jesus will lead us into dangerous positions. And in the midst of the danger, it might seem like he's sleeping, right? Just like the disciples are going to see right here. But really, ultimately, what Jesus is doing is he is giving us an opportunity to demonstrate how we're going to react to the situation and a demonstration. Uh, He's giving us an opportunity to demonstrate how we view him, right? And ultimately, that's what Jesus is doing for the disciples right here. Yes, he is actively sleeping, and this is definitely a huge callback to the story of Jonah whenever Jonah is in the boat sleeping, whenever there's all these rushing, you know, winds and storms and all that stuff going on. So Jesus is actually sleeping here, but there is this metaphorical way where you can interpret this, where you see, like, like this general principle, right? The disciples follow Jesus. He is the one who led them to the boat. He is the one who led them out to the sea. He knew that this storm was going to be here. Yet what does he do? He sleeps and he lets them handle it alone because he wants to see how they're going to respond. This is what Jesus is going to do in our own lives, right? We follow him and he is going to lead us into situations that are not comfortable. And he's going to lead us into situations that we might not necessarily like. And he's going to lead us into situations where he's really testing us to figure out how we're going to react to the situation and to see whether or not we are going to trust in him. A big aspect of this story right here is their faith. And he doesn't say that they don't have any faith. He just says that their faith is really little, right? So that's kind of a compliment, but it's mainly an insult, right? You have little faith, right? And so there is a principle of discipleship that's being taught here because really one thing I've been trying to highlight is that this whole miracles of the king section in chapters eight and nine is really being interwoven by lessons about discipleship, right? Jesus performs miracles, lesson about discipleship. Miracles, discipleship. Miracles, discipleship. That's the whole structure of this thing. And so as we're seeing these miracles unfold, we're really needing to focus on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And so he gets into the boat, his disciples follow him, and behold, right? Uh, And now, like, basically, once again, I always try to highlight this. Whenever you see behold um, in the Bible, this is really the author trying to invite you to see the scene from their perspective, the surprise. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being covered with the waves. But Jesus himself was sleeping, right? Uh, if you've ever been to the Sea of Galilee, you'll know that storms can just show up um, really at just any time, right? And it's because the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by hills. And basically the way it works is that the wind coming up over the hills, they rush down to the sea and then it just stirs up the water and just storms can show up out of nowhere, right? Well, this is one of those storms, right? They're out at sea, they're in the middle of the water and the storm breaks out. And of all people, Jesus is sleeping, Why is he sleeping? I don't know. Maybe he's tired. If you know anything about this guy, he's a guy who works hard. He wakes up early to pray. He stays up late at night to the pray. And then throughout his day, he's ministering to people. He's talking to people. He's probably tired, right? He needs rest. He is human, right? What I love about this is that the the beauty of this story is that we really get to see the dual nature of Christ's 
like like whole like the whole hypostatic union of Christ, right? Truly God, truly man. We see both of those at play in the story, right? Because here we see Jesus at probably his most human moment that we've seen him thus far in the gospel. He's sleeping, right? What's more human than sleeping, right? He is asleep in a boat in the middle of the storm. And if you're a reader of scripture, this should immediately call back to the prophet Jonah, who also slept in the middle of a storm. The difference is that that storm in Jonah's story was because he was running away from God, right? And the, in that story, uh, it was interesting because all the pagan sailors actually responded more properly than Jonah did, right? Well, Jesus is not Jonah. He's not running away from God. None of that is true, but there is a callback here, right? Jesus is like the prophet sleeping in the boat, and the prophet is the one with the solution to the storm problem, right? For Jonah, he had to be thrown into the water. We're going to have to see what Jesus suggests as a solution. And so we see Jesus at his most human moment, and the disciples come up to him, and they got him up, and they said, save us, Lord. We are perishing. So to their credit, they go up to him, and they ask him to save them, right? It implies that they think that he can do something to help. Maybe it's just because he's the oldest person in the group, and they're all just a bunch of teenagers, and they're like, hey, we don't know what to do. We're dying. But at the very least, they do go up to him, but at the same time, they're panicking, right? They are not trusting that he can actually do something necessarily, they're freaking out and they think they are going to die. And they're wondering why he brought them out there. And he said to them, why are you so cowardly, you men of little faith? This is a rebuke, right? Outright rebuke. Yes, he is acknowledging that they have a little bit of faith, but he's getting on to them. Why are you so cowardly? He says, why are you freaking out, right? And this is not Jesus just being cranky. He is genuinely asking them, why are you freaking out? Do you not know that I can handle the situation? Right? This is the irony. Jesus expects them to understand that he could accomplish this situation, even though they're still beginning to learn who he is. Right, But this is just who Jesus is. Right, He knows what he can accomplish, and he has asserted that he can accomplish these things. Right, The whole Sermon on the Mount was about him having the authority. The issue is that the disciples haven't totally bought into it quite yet. Right, That's why he rebukes them. Because his word should be enough. He says he has the authority to do all these things. He says he has the authority to enter, bring people into the kingdom of heaven right? He can handle a little storm, but he rebukes them. And he said, and then it says, then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the sea and it became perfectly calm, right? So he rebukes the disciples and then he rebukes the sea and the sea gets calm. And I imagine that what happens afterwards is the disciples get calm. And then what I want you to notice here is the way they respond, because this is the main point of the story. And the men marveled and they said, what kind of a man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now we read this and uh, a lot of times we'll just kind of overlook this and we'll just be like, okay, yeah, the disciples were impressed by who Jesus is. That's not all that's going on here, right? They are not simply being like, wow, that was amazing. Because there's a lot of other miracles that Jesus has performed so far. And Matthew hasn't gone out of his way to demonstrate like detail how the disciples responded, right? I imagine they were amazed by all of this. But there's something in particular about this miracle that gets the gears turning in the disciples' heads to where they are all just looking at each other and they're wondering, what type of guy is this? And in order for you to understand this, we have to do a little bit of an Old Testament theology. And keep in mind, Matthew's original readers of his gospel are Jewish, right? They would be familiar with the Old Testament. They would not have to do this Old Testament theology because they would immediately know this stuff. If you go way back, to Genesis chapter 1. God creates the heavens and he creates the earth, right? You have this whole six-day thing where God goes one by one. The first three days, he fills the earth, or I mean, he gives the earth form. The second three days, he fills the void, right? In Genesis 1-2, it says the earth was formless and void. Well, days one through three, he gives it form. Days four through six, he fills the void, right? And then at the very end of day six, God creates man, and when God creates man, he gives man dominion. And he says, like, if you actually just outline the things that God gives man dominion over, it's very clear that what God gives man dominion over is the earth, right? So God is creator of heavens and the earth, and he gives man dominion over the earth, right? So what God has over all creation, man has over earth, right? He is supposed to exercise dominion over the earth while the heavens and the earth in their entirety belong to God. Okay, well, that means that the heavens are the domain that are uniquely under the authority of God, right? Man has authority over all things on earth. He is supposed to tame animals. He's supposed to tame all those things. But there are certain things that man cannot control, and those are things in regards to the heavens, 
right? The sun, the moon, and the stars, the things that govern the day, the things that govern the night, the things that govern the seasons, the thing that govern the weather. Man cannot control those things, nor will he ever be able to control those things. Man cannot make days longer. Man cannot make days shorter. Man cannot make winter shorter. Man cannot make summer longer, right? They can do things, hypothetically, that affect the weather, but they cannot control it, right? Because the heavens are in the domain of God. God gave man dominion over the earth, but not the heavens. The heavens are strictly God's domain. That is established from Genesis chapter 1, which then leads Babel, later biblical verses to assert this even further, right? You go to Job chapter 38, this is exactly what God is exclaiming to Job. God says this, Or who enclosed the sea with doors when, bursting forth, it went out from the womb, when I made a cloud its garment, and dense gloom its swaddling band, and I placed boundaries on it, and set a bolt and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, but no further, and here shall your proud waves stop. God is speaking to Job, and he says, who's in charge of the weather? Who's in charge of the seas? Not you, Job. Me. God. God is in charge of the heavens. God is in charge of the seas. Man is in charge of the earth and the living creatures on the earth. That is what man is in charge of. The rest of it, that belongs to God alone. You see, see the same thing in Psalm chapter 89, right? Verses 8 and 9. O Yahweh, God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty Yah? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the swelling of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. According to Psalm 89, who's the one who stills the waves? God. Not man. God. Yahweh is the only one who can still the waves. God himself is the only one who can still the waves. Jesus stands up right here and look what it says. He got up and rebuked the wind and the sea and it became perfectly calm. That's why the disciples are so freaked out. Because Jesus didn't have to say, in the name of God, and by the power of God, I rebuke you. He just tells the waves to shut up and it listens. He tells the storm to shut up and the storm shuts up. That's why the disciples are so freaked out. Because according to their theology, there's only one person who has the ability to control the weather, and that is God himself. Any other time you have some sort of prophet or somebody in the Bible doing something in regards to the weather, they are doing that under the authority of God. But Jesus doesn't appeal to any other authority. The only authority he appeals to is his own. He rebukes them for not having faith in him. And then he turns and rebukes the waves, and the waves obey. And that's why the disciples say, what kind of a man is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. Because they've been listening to what Jesus has been saying. And he's been making big claims of authority, right? He's been saying some really important stuff about himself, and he's been saying he could do some really big stuff. And you know, a lot of people might just think that maybe this guy's a little bit arrogant. Maybe this guy's a little bit proud. Maybe he's overstating things. But now the disciples are looking, and they're realizing, you know, this guy, he just did something only God can do. He doesn't just have power to heal sicknesses, right? He's not just a really, like, he's not a miraculous doctor. He literally can speak to creation itself and force it into submission by his words. Who does that sound like? God. Let there be light, and there was light. This is what God does, right? Genesis chapter 1, that's the theology. God speaks and creation obeys. The disciples, they wake Jesus up from a nap and he gets up and he speaks and creation obeys. He has power over nature. And so here you have Jesus at his most human point in the gospel, right? He's sleeping, but that's immediately followed by his most divine moment in the gospel so far. He speaks to creation and it obeys. And this is the first moment where the disciples begin to realize, have we been hanging out with God in the flesh? And it doesn't mean that they're totally on board with that yet, but this is where the wheels in their head begin to turn, and they begin to realize that this itinerant rabbi they've been following, he might not just be the Messiah, and he might not just be a king, and he might not just be a prophet, he might not just be a priest, he might literally be God in the flesh. He might literally be the angel of the Lord from the Old Testament showing up in the flesh. This is blowing their minds. That's why this story is so important. We move on. Verses 28 through 34. And when he came to the other side into the region of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. And behold, they cried out saying, 
What do we have to do with you, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. And the demons began to plead with him, saying, If you are going to cast us out, send us to the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. And coming out, they went into the swine. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. Now the herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniacs. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Once again, notice how at the very end, we see a reaction to Jesus. So the disciples, they were marveling and they were wondering, what type of man is this? These people are going to respond a little bit differently. So walking through this, when Jesus came to the other side, right? So he calms the storm. They get to the other side of the water. They get out of the boat. They are in the region of these people known as the Gadarenes, right? And one thing that we can tell you right off the bat is that this is Gentile territory. We are now in the region known as the Decapolis area, right? This is an, a region that would be um, like Decapolis means 10 cities, right? This is a very Hellenistic area, very gen, like a lot of Gentile influence in this area. Uh, and one reason that we know that this is definitely Gentile area is because there's a lot of pigs nearby. Right. And if you know anything about the Jewish law and prohibitions in regards to food, Jewish people would not have a lot of pigs. Right. They would not have any pigs, probably because, um, you know, they weren't allowed to eat them. Right. And so they're in Gentile area. And this is very interesting uh, because so far Jesus ministry has been primarily to Jewish people. But at the same time, he's going beyond that. Right. Think about the second miracle we saw in last week's cycle right? A Roman centurion comes to Jesus, right? And so the first miracle was towards a Jewish person. The second miracle was towards a Gentile. Well, same thing here, right? The first miracle was directed towards Jewish people, his disciples. And now he's performing a miracle to a Gentile group of people, right? Also notice in the first cycle, there were more individual miracles, whereas here it's in front of a crowd and stuff like that, right? Uh, they're becoming more public and more public as we go. Right. And so he goes into Gentile territory. And this is so interesting that he's not just ministering to Jewish people. Like in the last story, the Gentile came to him, right? The Roman centurion came to Jesus. Well, in this story, Jesus goes to the Gentiles, right? The Jewish king, he steps out into Gentile territory, expanding his ministry to them, which tells us, and this is what Matthew's trying to communicate, that the gospel of the kingdom is not just focused on the Jewish people. Right? That's going to be a big component of this whole thing that he's arguing in this gospel. He's writing to Jewish people, but he's pointing out that the gospel was always intended for all the nations. And that's ultimately how this whole gospel is going to end, right? Take the gospel to all the nations. That's what Jesus is going to say in the final verses. And so Jesus goes into Gentile territory, uh, and uh, what they do is they encounter two demon-possessed men uh, who meet him as they're coming out of the tombs. If you go to the other gospels, they only really mention one of the men. Uh, but Matthew here, he's being a little bit more precise. He mentions that there are two men. Uh, what I'm going to assume is that from the other Gospels accounts, maybe one of them was more vocal than the other, right? Uh, and so uh, they basically come across these two uh, these two demon-possessed men uh, who were coming out of the tombs because basically this is just where those people lived, right? These, te these two demon-possessed men, they hung out at the cemetery uh, and they would basically just cause ruckus, cause all these problems. Uh, and it says they were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. If somebody was wanting to visit a tomb, if somebody was wanting to walk by the cemetery, these guys would not let it happen, right? These guys were powerful. They were violent. They were fierce. Uh, they were basically an annoyance to the entire public, right? Uh, because apparently they had some sort of supernatural power given to them by these demons that they could accomplish just like this, these crazy acts of violence that basically everybody knew to stay away from that region, right? Well, Jesus... He walks directly into the region. He is undisturbed by this, right? He seems like a man on a mission. He shows up and he is here to fix some problems. And behold, the demons cried out saying, what do we have to do with you, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? So this is an interesting response uh, because th this tells us a little bit about the supernatural realm. When you read the Bible, you have to realize it doesn't tell us a lot about how the supernatural realm works. It just tells us enough that we need to know so that we can understand the story that is being laid out here, right? Uh, and right here, we learn a little bit about the supernatural realm because we get to see certain things that the demons immediately know, right? First off, they know who Jesus is, right? What do we have to do with you, son of God? They call him son of God. Nobody else has called him that so far, right? But the demons, they acknowledge Jesus is the son of God. 
right? They know who he is right off the bat. That's the first thing. A second thing that they know is that he has authority over them, right? Have you come here to torment us? Right? They know that Jesus has the ability to do this. And later on, they're going to say, if you're going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. Right? So they acknowledge that Jesus has authority over them. Which leads me to the third thing that they already notice is that they already know that they are destined for future judgment. Right? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Right? So this lets us know a little bit about the mentality of demons. They know exactly who Jesus is. They know exactly what authority he has over them. And they know that they are destined for future judgment. It gives you an understanding of really how the supernatural realm works, especially from a demonic perspective, right? Demons are like that person that you push into the pool and they know that they're falling in. And so their goal is not to not fall in the water. Their goal is to simply bring as many people down with them as possible as they're falling down, right? Um, That's kind of the mentality of a demon, right? They know that they're destined for destruction. They just want to bring people down with them as they're falling. And so... They see Jesus and they say, what do we have to do with you, son of God? Right? They're like, hey, we're not causing you any trouble. Why are you here? What are you like? You know, we're hanging out in this area. We were not over in the Jewish region. We're in Gentile territory. Why are you interrupting us? Like, what did we do to bother you? Have you just come here to torment us before the time? They're like, hey, (laughs) this is not like they're they're afraid of him. But they're also saying like, yo, this is not in judgment time. Right? We're not we're not at judgment day yet. Why are you here to disturb us? Are you just here to bother us? Are you just here to disrupt us? And then it continues to explain. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them, right? This is Matthew's way of just like mentioning a detail that's going to be relevant in just a second, right? So there's a bunch of swine over there, right? And then the demons began to plead with Jesus saying, if you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. What's funny is that Jesus hasn't even spoken anything yet, um, according to Matthew's gospel. Maybe Jesus did respond, something like that. But the... Demons seem to understand what Jesus is doing here, right? Jesus is here to get rid of them, right? Uh, He's going to cast them out and they're basically afraid and they're wondering, okay, are you here to cast us into eternal judgment? Because it's not judgment day yet. So we'd rather that not happen, right? (laughs) And so they're basically trying to wiggle their way out of it, right? They're like, all right, well, if you are going to cast us out, if that's really what you're committed to, could you at least cast us into those swine over there? right? The idea is that they don't want to be totally destroyed or obliterated or sent into eternal judgment. They would rather just be cast somewhere else. It also lets you know how many demons we're dealing with here, right? Uh, If you look at the other gospels, you actually see a greater explanation of this and they'll call it like the demons will identify themselves as legion and stuff like that. There's actually thousands of demons in these men. That's wild, right? But there's a herd of swine and basically they're saying, hey, if you're going to take us out of these two men, send us into those swine, right? So they don't want to face eternal judgment yet. They don't want to be totally destroyed or obliterated. They are like, you know what? If if you want to save these two dudes, at the very least, just send us over into the pigs, right? Don't take us away from existence and don't cast us into hell quite yet. That's what the demons are requesting. Uh, They're not denying the fact that Jesus can do this, right? Jesus has authority over them. They are not denying that. They are afraid of him. They know that he could send them to hell right now if he wanted to. Instead, they just make a request. They're like, hey, Jesus... Send us into the swine. And so Jesus grants them a request. He says, go. Um, He's like, sure, go for it. Go into the swine. (laughs) And then something unexpected happens, right? The thing that the demons were not expecting. And coming out, they went into the swine. And behold, the whole herd rushed out. I love the behold. (laughs) Matthew's like allowing us to be surprised with him. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. Um, That's what the demons didn't expect right? So Jesus is like, I mean, I'll give you your request. That's not going to change the fact that you're dying today. <laughs> uh, and so Jesus cast the demons into the pigs, but then he cast the pigs into the waters so that the pigs die and therefore the demons, they don't have anywhere to go, right? Uh, and so the demons can no longer harm anybody, right? Uh, and so the demons thought that they were getting a good deal out of this, but turns out they were not. Uh, and so Jesus casts them into the pigs, the pigs run into the water, and that is how that story kind of ends. Um, one thing I want to highlight here is that Jesus is delivering these men from like oppression, right? Demonic oppression, right? This is a beautiful moment of Jesus coming into this Gentile area and he's healing these two demon possessed men. We don't know if they're Gentile or Jew. We don't know about that. Um, but he heals these men and he removes their demonic oppression from them. But there's also a cost that comes with this, right? They are delivered, but it comes at the cost of these pigs, right? All these pigs are going to go 
And that leads people to respond differently. Now the herdsmen ran away and they went into the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniacs, right? Uh, What's interesting here uh, is that Matthew highlights that the people reported everything, including what happened to the demoniacs, as if the thing that happened to the demoniacs was an extra footnote. It lets you know what the people were emphasizing, right? The people were going in and when they're reporting this stuff that's happening, they're not emphasizing that those two demon-possessed men were liberated. They're emphasizing the fact that our herd of pigs were killed. This dude showed up on our shore and he sent a bunch of our pigs into the water and they died. Oh yeah, and by the way, those two demon-possessed dudes, they're they're fine now, right? That is not exactly how this should be portrayed, right? They should be going through the streets rejoicing and they should be like, guys, the two demon-possessed men, they have been restored. They've been delivered from their oppression. Oh yeah, and by the way, some of the pigs died. That should be how the people respond, but instead they flip-flopped it right? They're emphasizing the pig thing and the demon possession thing is a footnote, right? Oh yeah, including that information. And behold, once again, he's inviting you to watch it and be surprised. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus and you're expecting them to thank him and just be like, wow, Jesus, thank you so much for delivering these two men. Thank you so much for delivering our people from these demon oppressed men uh, who have been so violent and stuff and who've just made our life really hard. But that's not how they respond. Behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. This is really sad. They value the money they lost through the pigs over their love for the two men who had been saved. So rather than thanking Jesus and being grateful, they ask him to leave. That's really sad. <laughs> I mean, Jesus came over here. It seems like his express purpose was to deliver this demoniac. We don't even know what else he would have done if they hadn't asked him to leave. But this is the reception he gets. They ask him to leave. And I think what's really good about this is that we get to realize that Matthew isn't go like his gospel is not like just slamming the Jewish people, right? It's not like it's an anti-Jewish pro-Gentile gospel, right? Ultimately, the trajectory of this gospel is that the Jewish people are going to reject Jesus and therefore the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles, but he's not portraying it as if all Jews are bad and all Gentiles are good. Well, no, we just saw an example of Jewish people who are following Jesus, right? The disciples, right? There are plenty of Jewish people who are following Jesus. And in the same way, there are plenty of Gentile people who are also going to reject Jesus, this being an example of it, right? And so, yes, you do have people like the Roman centurion who are going to show more faith than any of the people of Israel, But then you also have some Gentiles who just aren't going to receive Jesus. And he's going to come to them and they're going to immediately say, go back home. We don't want you. Right? And so I do like that. Uh, It's not like this is a big polemic against the Jewish people. Right? Matthew is simply demonstrating, he's just talking about what happened. He is not, he doesn't have an agenda against the Jewish people. Because keep in mind, Matthew himself is a Jewish person. This then leads us to the next miracle, which is another very popular one. Right? I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 and we'll uh, talk about verse 8 afterwards because ultimately that's kind of like the summary of Jesus' ministry at this time period. Verses 1 through 7. And getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city, right? So he gets into a boat, he goes back across the sea, and he returns to his own city, which is referring not to Nazareth, but to Capernaum, right? This is where Jesus is living now, right? So they travel back across. He just submits to what the people asked him to do. And behold, once again, and behold, (laughs) I just like to emphasize that because the, the reason I emphasize the whole behold thing is because it shows, this is like the Hebrew nature of Matthew's gospel, right? If you go read the Old Testament, you'll realize that this is how Jewish people talk, right? In Hebrew, it's the word hene, right? Uh, It's behold, right? This this is how they tell a story. They're trying to invite the person to see from their perspective. Um, And this is unique in Matthew's gospel. You see it a little bit in the other gospels, but not nearly as much as you do in Matthew's, right? Matthew's is a very Jewish gospel. And so you see him telling the story like a Jewish person tells the story. And behold, They brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And he got up and went home. 
Now, what's interesting about this story is that there's a lot of details that Matthew just really doesn't share with us that we do see in the other Gospels, right? The other Gospels explain that the reason, like, like the whole, like really the other Gospels explain the situation and the circumstances leading to this miracle, right? Jesus is teaching a crowd of people, and as he's teaching the crowd of people, it is so crowded that basically what they have to do is they have to remove the tiles from the roof and lower the paralytic on a bed through the roof, right? That's how the story actually played out. Matthew doesn't really share any of those details because that's not what Matthew is chiefly concerned with, right? Matthew isn't chiefly concerned with the drama of the situation. He's concerned with the authority that Jesus is demonstrating in the story itself. So what we see is that Matthew just gets straight to the point. And behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. He doesn't mention anything about the crowd gathered outside the house. He doesn't mention anything about the roof. He simply mentions that there's a paralytic guy lying on a bed. This is a problem. Jesus needs to handle it. Seeing their faith... Jesus said to the paralytic, take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, this is a very interesting thing. Jesus sees the faith of his, this guy's friends, and that leads him to turn to the man and say, your sins are forgiven. Now, is the man's sins forgiven simply because of the people's faith? Well, I don't think that's exactly what the implication is here. Um, because ultimately, you have to realize that this man could not have taken himself. So apparently, this man has asked to be brought here, or his friends have brought him here and he is the one who consented to be brought here, right? Either way, this man has faith and the friends have faith as well. And so Jesus looks at the man and you would expect him to immediately say, get up and walk. But that's not what Jesus is doing because Jesus is a bit theatrical sometimes, right? And Jesus knows that there's a crowd here. Uh, even if Matthew hasn't mentioned it so far, we're going to see that there are some people watching in just a second. Jesus knows that people are watching. And he knows how these people are going to think. And so what Jesus does is he sets this up as a moment for him to reveal something about himself. Once again, that's what all these miracles are about. Jesus is revealing something about himself. The first miracle, he has power over nature. The second miracle, he has power over the supernatural. In this miracle, he's demonstrating that he has power over sin. That's what the miracle is about. None of these miracles are simply about the action being performed, it's about what the action says about who Jesus is. It's about communicating his identity and his authority, right? And so Jesus, rather than turning to this man and saying, get up and walk, he turns to him and he says something surprising. Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. Now, he isn't functioning like a priest who had to offer a sacrifice to communicate this, right? He, he didn't, you know, he didn't say, hey, go to the temple and offer these sacrifices and your sins are forgiven. He didn't say anything like that. Uh, and honestly, we don't even know what sins he's talking about, right? Did the man do something against Jesus? Well, no, that doesn't seem to be the case. Jesus is speaking very broadly here. He says, your sins are forgiven. And when he says sins, it doesn't seem like he's talking about any specific sin in particular. He's not talking about some sin that the man committed against Jesus. He's not talking about some sin that needs any particular sacrifice for atonement that would be accomplished by the law down in Jerusalem or something like that. No. No. Jesus simply says, your sins are forgiven, and it's a blanket statement. He simply seems to be talking about all of the man's sins. And this is, once again, in response, like in regards to the man's faith, right? Faith is a big thing throughout all these things, uh, because once again, faith is an essential component of discipleship. So he turns to the guy and he says, your sins are forgiven, which is a surprising thing to say. And then, since we're talking about surprising things to say, Matthew says, and behold, right? Once again, he's trying to surprise you. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man blasphemes, right? And so the scribes, they're apparently watching this, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees. And as they're watching Jesus and they hear him say this, they understand the implications of what Jesus is saying, right? This is not simply a man forgiving another man for doing something wrong. This is a man saying something that only God can say, right? The scribes pick up on this. That's why they say this man blasphemes. He is asserting something that only God can assert, because only God can forgive sins. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. So this is cool. Jesus is apparently able to read minds in this situation. Uh, or at the very least, he knows their hearts. Which, once again... Go back to 1 Samuel, right? Who is it who knows hearts? God, right? Man looks to the outward appearance. God looks to the heart. Jesus looks to these people and he says something about their heart that they had not said out loud, 
right? The scribes were speaking to themselves. This man blasphemes. They're probably whispering to one another and thinking even worse in their heart. Jesus turns to them and he says exactly what's in their heart because he is God in the flesh. This is why it's so ridiculous whenever people suggest that the Bible never actually claims Jesus is God. If you know anything about the Bible and if you have read the Old Testament, it is shouting at you that Jesus is claiming to be God, he is revealing this slowly but surely. Yes, he's not going around saying, I'm God, I'm God. Because if he did that, he would be killed immediately. But he's doing things that are slowly revealing to people and it's forcing people to come to terms with the fact that he is indeed God, right? So they're saying this man blasphemes and he knows their thoughts and he says, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Like God, he goes past the external appearance and he looks to the heart, which is gonna be something that we come back to in a second. And he says, for which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. He says, you don't think that I can forgive sins? All right, well, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? Well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because you can tell somebody their sins are forgiven, but who can test that, right? I could go tell somebody their sins are forgiven, but that doesn't mean their sins are actually forgiven. Anybody can say that. I cannot tell a paralytic to get up and walk. And so Jesus is basically saying this, all right, well, it's a lot harder to tell a paralytic to get up and walk. And if he does that, that is God giving his seal of approval to the fact that I can do this, right? And so he says, um, but so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed and go home. Jesus calls himself the son of man here. Uh, this is one of Jesus' favorite titles for himself. There's a lot of implications about this, both in Ezekiel and in Daniel and just in general. There's a lot of implications of that. We're not going to get into that right now because I'm sure we're going to be talking about this a lot as we go forward um, in the gospel. Uh, but see what Jesus is saying here, right? This whole miracle, he could have just turned to the man and said, get up and walk. But that's not how Jesus set this up. He wanted to set this up in order to reveal something about himself. He wanted to real reveal, first off, that he can forgive sins. And secondly, that he knows the hearts of man, right? This man's sins are forgiven. Meanwhile, the scribes, they are thinking evil in their hearts right? Their sins are probably not forgiven. That's the implication, right? They're rejecting Jesus. And so Jesus says, I'm going to tell this paralytic guy to get up and walk. And if I don't have the authority to forgive sins, God will prevent me from being able to actually do this. But if I can forgive sins, then God will not stop me. And so he tells the man, get up, pick up your bed and go home. In verse seven, we read, and he got up and he went home. Therefore, showing that not only does Jesus have the ability to heal paralytics, but he also has the ability to forgive sins, which once again is something that only God can do. Jesus is the greater prophet. He can calm the storms with the word of his mouth. He is the greater king. He can cast out demons with the word of his mouth. And he's the greater priest. He can forgive sins with the word of his mouth. He can do what only God can do. He has the authority over nature, the authority over the supernatural, and the authority over sin itself. This is who Jesus is. Which then leads us to Matthew's summary of his ministry at this time period. But when the crowd saw this, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. All right, so we get to see some different responses here, right? First off, the crowds are afraid, right? Who are they afraid of? Jesus. This is terrifying. Right? Because once again, it's all about his authority. Whenever you realize that somebody with this much of authority is in your presence, I know that we think that's a really comforting thing. No, this is terrifying, right? Whenever the Bible talks about our need to fear God, it is not simply talking about respect. It is talking about fear, right? There are Greek and Hebrew words for respect, but the Bible consistently chooses the word fear because whenever you realize how much authority God has, it is a fearful thing to stand in his presence. That does not mean that you should be terrified from him and run away. It means that you should be so scared of him that you want nothing else than to be as close to him as possible because you want him on your side. Well, these guys, like the crowds at this time, they are largely responding to him in a favorable manner. The scribes might not be. They're calling him a blasphemy, blasphemer. But the crowds are responding positively, right? They see Jesus and they're afraid of him. They fear him and this is a good thing. And they glorified God as a result because he had given such authority to men. So we see that the crowds, they're still not fully understanding what's going on here. Is Jesus God or has he simply received authority from God? This is the thing, right? They, and this is probably where they would land, right? They think that God is giving the authority to Jesus and Jesus himself will assert that all authority he has came from the Father, right? 
that doesn't change the fact that Jesus is God, right? So ironically, this statement is true. God did give such authority to men because Jesus is a man and he is exercising this authority because of the Father. But at the same time, Jesus is doing things which only God himself can do. Jesus is God. Jesus is man. This is how we arrive at this theology, right? Jesus is truly God, truly man. Uh, it comes from stuff like this, and you just have to have an Old Testament background to understand the implications of this stuff, right? Uh, and so the crowds, they're still trying to figure out who this Jesus guy is. What is the deal with him? And so we move on. Um, if Just an FYI, if you haven't picked up on it yet, this is probably going to be a little bit of a long video, but that's okay. We move on, and now that we've seen the three miracles, we move into our discipleship section, right? Because that's kind of how this whole thing goes, right? It's miracle, 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 summary of ministry, discipleship. Well, we go into verse 9, uh, and this is what we read. And as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office, and he said to him, follow me, and he stood up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Uh, so here, again, we see two vastly different reactions to Jesus, right? On the one side, we see Matthew, uh, who we can call the traitor or the sellout, and he comes to Jesus without question, abandoning his life of luxury and just following Jesus. On the other hand, you have the Jewish religious leaders who should have been the ones who are more inclined to follow Jesus, right? Because they're the ones who should have been best prepared, being well-versed in the scriptures, yet they're the ones who are rejecting Jesus and opposing him. Right? And so we see this dichotomy right here, these different reactions to Jesus. People are splitting, right? As Jesus grows in popularity, the line in the sand is becoming longer and wider to where people are being pushed to one side or the other and they're having to decide where they land. And so we start in verse 9. Jesus went on from there, right? Uh, going on from the story we just read about the paralytic. And he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he stood up and followed him. What I love here is that Matthew doesn't really draw attention to himself, right? Uh, literally, like, in pretty much all the other Gospels, uh, this story takes up two verses. Well, in the Gospel of Matthew, it just takes up one verse, right? Matthew just tells his story and moves on. And even going into verses 10 through 13, the other Gospels tell us that this dinner party happens at Matthew's house. Matthew doesn't draw attention to that here, right? So I love that we see the humility of Matthew in this. Um, but this is a really cool story, right? Just that one verse, it's so important right? It's so important that the other gospel shared as well. So Jesus goes on, he comes across a man called Matthew, and this man is sitting at the tax office. I mean, there's only one verse long, but already there's a huge story behind this, right? Because this guy is sitting at the tax booth, we know so much about him, right? This is a Jewish man named Matthew, but he's sitting at a tax booth. Well, there's only certain ways you would, have, you would have ended up at a tax booth as a Jewish man, and let's just say you're not going to be viewed very favorably, right? Uh, this is something, if you ever watch the TV show The Chosen, they capture this really well. Um, Matthew is probably the, one of the characters they've done the best because, like Matthew, we know very little bit about him from the Gospels, right? But just his profession itself speaks volumes as to how he would have been viewed by his society, Right? Tax collectors were hated for both political and religious reasons. For political reasons, it's because they were cooperating with the enemy, right? The Romans were the people who were oppressing the Jewish people at this time period. And so if you were a tax collector, you were viewed as aiding and abetting the oppressors, right? You were helping the Romans do that, right? You were taxing them. You were cheating them. You were serving yourself. For religious reasons, they were despised because they were dealing so closely with Gentiles, unclean Gentiles, which basically was viewed by most Jewish people at this time period as equivalent of abandoning the faith, right? If you are dealing so closely with Gentiles, you must not value God very highly. Another way to view this is that in Jewish eyes, tax collectors were the epitome of serving mammon rather than God, right? So if you go back to the Sermon on the Mount, no wonder Matthew highlights those things, right? Matthew highlights that Jesus said, you, have, you can't serve both God and mammon. You can't serve two masters, you can't value material things. You can't be anxious about material things. Your heavenly father will take care of you. These would have been t 
teachings that pierced Matthew's heart as a tax collector. He would have heard these things and it would have rocked him because he was valuing material possessions. He was valuing these things. He had chosen to be despised by his community because he wanted money, right? That, that's the only way a Jewish person would have ended up in a tax booth. It's because they didn't value their God as much and they valued money enough to be despised by their community just to make some extra money. That's pretty much the only reason they would have ended up in a tax booth. So the fact that Matthew's sitting here tells us a lot about him, which makes his reaction so surprising. And Jesus said to him, follow me. And he stood up and followed him. Matthew may have been a tax collector who was despised for both political and religious reasons. But whenever it comes down to it, he follows Jesus as quickly as did Simon, Andrew, James, and John. Jesus says, follow me. And Matthew gets up and does it. Now, we don't know Matthew's background. We don't know if he, like, like how exactly he knew enough about Jesus to motivate him to follow him, right? This definitely was not his first encounter. He definitely had heard of Jesus' reputation, uh, especially this is presumably in Capernaum, right? And so if they're in Capernaum, well, Matthew's definitely heard about the things that have been going on over here, right? Uh, and who knows, maybe the stuff that Matthew's been sharing in his gospel was his introductory stuff to Jesus, right? Maybe Matthew was present at the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe Matthew heard about these other miracles happening, and that's what motivated him to follow Jesus. But whatever it is, despite the fact that Jesus, uh, despite the fact that Matthew had been willing to abandon his family and abandon his Jewish people to serve as a tax collector, something that Jesus had to offer him, he deemed worthy enough to also abandon his post as a Roman and return to the faith, and return back to God. That is cool. We don't know what his motivations were. He doesn't detail it, right? He simply tells us, this is my story, and moves along. Then it happened that, as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. So, uh, immediately after this, right, they go, and the other gospels inform us this is at Matthew's house, right? Uh, and Matthew ends up hosting a party for Jesus, right? And it's not just Matthew there, but other tax collectors and sinners have been invited as well, right? Matthew realizes what he has received from Jesus, and he realizes that Jesus is apparently willing to associate with people like tax collectors, and most of Matthew's friends are probably tax collectors and sinners because he probably didn't associate with good people, right? He probably was not the most devout person, right? Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they might have been devout Jews before they followed Jesus. Matthew, he was not, and so he doesn't hang around with the best crowd, but still, he invites all of his friends to meet the new rabbi that he's following. And Jesus, he sits there, he reclines at the table with them. You got to understand that in Jewish culture, reclining at a table is a big deal. In ancient cultures in general, and in a lot of still Middle Eastern cultures to this day, table fellowship is a really big deal. And so by Jesus doing this, he is communicating that he loves these people. And he is willing to associate with them on a friendly basis without judgment. Well, the Pharisees are not going to be happy about this, right? And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? What you have to realize about the Pharisees is that they were hyper fixated on holiness. They had developed this entire oral law uh, built upon the law in order to just kind of drive home the fact that we are called to be holy people. And this is good on one side of things because the Pharisees rightly understood that we are called to be holy, right? That is good. But in many ways, they had made holiness merely a matter of external performance, right? That was the main issue facing the Pharisees, right? They understood the call to be holiness, but they had made it merely an external thing. This is what Jesus is getting onto them about in the Sermon on the Mount. This is why our righteousness has to go beyond the scribes and the Pharisees, because it can't simply be an external thing. Internally, as we're going to see in this passage, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were just as corrupt as everybody else, right? They were just as self-serving as everybody else. Their righteousness was an external badge of honor where they tried to parade around how clean and holy they were, which basically means that their holiness was all for show. They were set apart, but they weren't set apart in the ways that God wanted them to be. And that is what Jesus is going to highlight here, right? Because the Pharisees, they've heard about Jesus and Jesus is growing in popularity. He's got a reputation as this amazing rabbi guy who's got these amazing teachings and a lot of those teachings are about righteousness. And then he has the audacity to eat dinner with sinners and tax collectors. And the Pharisees are not having it. They approach the disciples and say, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? Who does he think he is? One day he's over here saying that he's this righteous guy who demands righteousness of his followers. He's performing all these miracles and now he's hanging out with these guys. He's sending a mixed message. He shouldn't be doing this, right? This is what the Pharisees are arguing, right? 
they're trying to correct Jesus and suggest he shouldn't do this. And they approach the disciples to ask this, but Jesus hears about it. And rather than disciples responding, Jesus responds. And he says, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Here we get to see how Jesus viewed his ministry. He says, I'm not here for healthy people. Because ultimately the point is there are no healthy people, right? But if there were healthy people, healthy people wouldn't need a physician. Jesus makes it clear, I am here as a physician, right? If you're healthy, you don't need me. The reason these people are at this table is because they realize they need me, right? So Jesus is at this table with them and he's not casting judgment on them, but that's because they already know that they're sinners who need him, right? It's another thing if somebody's denying that they need him, hence why Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees, right? Because they have the audacity to think that they don't need him and they have the audacity to think that they're the ones who deserve to have him at their table because they're good and pure and holy. And he says, well, you know what? I'm here as a physician. And so if you're good and pure and holy, you don't need me. And plus, I don't want to hang around with you anyways, right? So Jesus does judge the people who deny their sinfulness, but the people who recognize that they need a physician, Jesus says, that's the person I'm here for. And then he, Jesus, he really just slams into the people right here. Um, he, he basically just rebukes them and he says, but go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice for I did not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners. I love what Jesus does here because you have to realize like th there's humor here, right? Uh, but the Pharisees would not have been laughing. D Jesus' disciples probably would have been. The tax collectors and sinners probably would have been. The Pharisees were known as being the people who were so devout. Like these are the people who memorized the law, who memorized the Torah, right? These are the people who knew the scriptures like the back of their hand and tried to follow it to a T and who had built an entire law in addition to the Torah. And Jesus turns to them and says, go and learn what this verse means, right? He's saying, I think you forgot a verse in your Bible study. And what he does is he quotes Hosea chapter six right? And I'm going to read a few extra verses around this for you to understand the greater context of Hosea. But this is what God says in Hosea chapter six, starting in verse four. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your hesed, right? Your loving kindness, your steadfast love, your compassion. For your hesed is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. Therefore, I have hewn them in pieces by the prophets. I have killed them by the words of my mouth. And the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. For I delight in chesed rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam, they have trespassed against the covenant. There they have dealt treacherously against me. What Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees for is that they were all about external religious activity. But as a result of hyper fixating on external religious activity, they had forgot the demands that God places on the heart. And he says that God, like God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire compassion, not sacrifice. I desire chesed, not sacrifice. Hesed is whenever you give to somebody who is undeserving something which is unbelievable, right? They have no right to expect it. You give it to them anyways. Why? Because you love them, because you're gracious. God says, that's what I desire more than your empty religious activity. And Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for not understanding that. They were right in focusing on holiness, but they were wrong because they made holiness purely an external thing. Peter Lightheart says this, Jesus is not condemning the Pharisees for paying attention to the details of the law. He is an advocate of the jots and tittles, as we saw in the Sermon on the Mount. But he is condemning them for paying so much attention to the jots and tittles that they miss the important thrust of the law, mercy and compassion and loyalty. Hesed, right? That's what Jesus is getting onto the Pharisees about here. And it's beautiful, right? And this is teaching us about discipleship, right? What does Jesus value of us as disciples, right? If we want to follow Jesus, we better learn that he desires mercy, not sacrifice, that he desires compassion, not sacrifice, that he desires chesed, not sacrifice. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to live externally righteous lives. It means that we have to address the heart issue before the external stuff even matters, Right? Yes, God wants the sacrifices. He demanded the sacrifices of the Jewish people, but it had to be preceded by a heart of devotion. Hear, O Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. It's about love. It's about compassion. It's about mercy. That was the end goal. That's why you're supposed to be set apart. You're supposed to live differently so that other people will see it and be drawn closer to your Lord and so that they will come to worship him. Right? You do it out of love. 
not out of external performance. Which then leads us to another lesson of discipleship, which we read to close out the section we're covering today. Then the disciples of John came to Jesus asking, uh, these are disciples of John the Baptist, they come to him asking, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the attendants of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins burst and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. So, um, basically what we have here is just another question. Once again, you see the word disciple coming up, right? And people are trying to figure out what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Well, these are disciples of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, he is going to be, you know, in prison, right? And the disciples of John the Baptist, they come to Jesus and they ask him, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast, right? John the Baptist, he's been teaching us to fast all the time. The Pharisees teach their disciples to fast, but why don't your disciples fast, right? It's just, it's just a question about practice, right? Why is it that your disciples do things differently? What are your reasons for doing this? And Jesus said to them, can the attendants of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. What Jesus is ultimately communicating here is that some customs and practices that we do, such as fasting, were somber acts of worship driven by longing, right? Um, and that longing that he's specifically really addressing here is a longing that mourning will one day turn to mirth, right? That the fasting will one day turn into feasting, right? Uh, with Jesus, though, he's pointing out that the feast has begun. Jesus is the bridegroom, right? The Jewish people for the longest time were waiting for their Messiah to arrive. And so they would fast and they would yearn and they would cry out, Maranatha, right? Come Lord, come Lord, come Lord, right? This has been the ache, like the Maranatha cry, crying for the Messiah to arrive and crying for God to bring about the judgment and the day of the Lord. This has been the cry since the beginning of Genesis, right? And people have been waiting for this. And Jesus points out, well, I'm here, right? I'm the bridegroom. The bridegroom has arrived for his bride, and he says, one day I'm going to leave, right? This is the first time that Jesus really makes mention of the fact that he's not going to be here a long time, right? He says, one day I'm going to be gone and then they'll fast again, right? So here's our first little allusion to the fact that things are going to once again look differently than we expected, right? Jesus is not necessarily doing the eschatological thing that the Old Testament promised, right? Jesus is here for a reason, but it's not to usher in the ultimate final kingdom of God. He's here for a time period and he's going to leave. And he points out that whenever I leave, then my disciples are going to fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined, but they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. Right? What he's doing is he's just using common examples to make the point that you, like, you do things to match the problem. Right? So you don't put unshrunk cloth on an old garment because that's going to end up ruining everything, right? In the same way, you don't put new wine into old wineskins because that ruins everything, right? You have to do things according to the what is demanded of the situation, right? You put a patch of unshrunk cloth on a new garment, right? You put new wine into new wineskins because that is what the situation demands. Okay, well, in the same way, the bridegroom is here and why would you be fasting in the middle of a wedding? Well, no, you don't fast in the middle of a wedding. You feast during the middle of a wedding. Well, whenever the bridegroom's away, well, then you probably should fast so that you can save up your appetite so that whenever the bridegroom arrives again, then you can have the wedding feast, right? And so that's what Jesus is pretty much arguing here. The bridegroom is present, and with his presence, everything is changing. Things are going to be different going forward, and that's really what Jesus is arguing here. The longing and aching of the Jewish heart has been fulfilled because their God has come to them, right? He doesn't say their God here, right? But the implication is that he is God. Because if you go back to the Old Testament, who is the bridegroom of Israel? God. And Jesus says the bridegroom's here, right? Well, Jesus is claiming to be God. Once again, Old Testament theology makes it very clear that Jesus is claiming to be God in a lot of these places, but he says it in just a subtle enough manner that people can't kill him immediately. Why would you need to fast when you're in the presence of the one who can still the seas, who can cast out demons, and who can forgive sins from the words of his mouth? You don't need to fast in the presence of a person like that. They had been waiting for their long-awaited Messiah, and finally he had come. And what he's ultimately communicating here 
is that he is better than they could have ever expected, right? He's the bridegroom, right? He's not simply the Messiah they've been longing for. He's the Messiah they didn't know they needed. And he's here and he's performing all these miracles. And therefore the time of mourning, that's not now, right? They mourned for a while as they awaited his return and they fasted as they longed for him. But now he's here and so they celebrate. Whenever he leaves again, they'll fast again and they'll mourn and they'll pick up that Maranatha cry. And they'll say, come, Lord, come, Lord, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus. They'll cry out again. But right now, Jesus says, I'm here. And so while I'm here, things are going to change. So get used to some change. And that's where we're going to stop today. Once again, I know that was a really long teaching compared to what we've been usually been doing. uh, But that's because there was so much to cover and because I get kind of excited about the material. Um, And I, I could have broken this up into smaller sections, but I'm really wanting to cover this in bigger chunks. And because this Matthew series is getting a lot longer than I originally anticipated. And so I'm kind of trying to get us through this uh, while also addressing it to a thorough manner. And so I hope you'll forgive me for making this lesson a little bit longer than normal. Uh, But that's all I've got for y'all today. Thank you so much for joining me on this whole journey. Uh, I hope that you're appreciating this. There's also a lot more that we could have talked about that we didn't. I'm just trying to focus on certain things. And I hope that you're fine with that. Uh, My name is David Tate. This is Now Let's Be Honest. Be sure to keep a smile on your face. Don't let anybody steal your joy. Remember who you are. And, of course, Maranatha.